What's up, Junkie Nation? Gorgeous George and Goes checking in here. It's the end of the year, and we're wrapping up a lot of, uh, you know, finishing touches on a great 2023 for the sport, the sport of mixed martial art, everything that brushes up on the sport. And, of course, uh, not a better person in the world to do this with than our good friend Eric Nixick from Extreme Couture. He's the general manager there. He's one of their head coaches over there. And he's a good friend of the show. What's going on, Eric? How are you? Good to see you, brother. Yeah. No, it's been been a good year. Now he's starting to talk about it. Yeah. Went by uh went by pretty fast. But the start of that year was a little rocky, you know, not knowing where where the big guy was gonna go and everything else. So no, it's it finished up the year nicely. That was January of 2023 when Dana, I believe after a fight night, said that they parted ways, he's free to go. And yep. of course, the whole fumble the bag thing started and um We'll get to that in a second, but what I wanted to ask you, are you the type of guy that can that you draw up plans or goals for the following year? Yeah, I'm not I'm not a a year by year guy. Um there I think you you have bullet points on kind of what you want to accomplish, but um I don't give it like an end of a timeline sort of thing, you know, where it's like, oh, I want to try to accomplish this within a year, but it it, it does give you a definite like so a focus, a focus point, if you will. So um, for me, I think there's things that I always try to look at, like what what can I do better? How can I um, be more efficient? What how did this year look? And areas that I can grow, things like that. But um, for the most part, I, I I try to do that monthly, weekly, you know, daily, because I think you put a, if you put a time stamp on it, sometimes you don't accomplish it in that time, but it doesn't mean it's still not a good goal. Could you ever have imagined? This is what I'm getting at that. In late 2023, if you were forecasting ahead, sorry, in, in late 2022, if you could have forecasted late 2023 that it would have went down like this. Because, look, I know you love your guys, but let me just say a few things here. Sean Strickland had, hadn't had had the best 2022. And then in 2023, he turned it around. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? He went light heavyweight, middleweight, and then middleweight title. And then Francis Ngannou, of course, he had kind of been stuck in this whole thing since, you know, the surreal gone fight, the injury, uh, the contract dispute. And so, you know, I, I I mean, like I say, the end of 2023 was amazing, you know, but and, and I'm, I'm sure there's other fighters as well that contributed to this with those two big ones, man. Did, could you have even conceived the way it went down? Uh, honestly, with with those guys and those individuals, I think that. I would say yes, because I just know who they are and what they're capable of and just kind of stick into the t- same mindset that got us where we were at today was just, you know, head down and grind and keep working and mm-hmm. good things will happen. You know, I, I know Sean was very discouraged after the Jared Cannonier fight. And, you know, I think that's the nice part about having each other is that like if one's down, the other one's there to pick the other guy up and, and kind of, you know, brush them off and get them back to work. And that was kind of my role after the Cannonier fight. Where it's like, hey man, th- this division is a, a division that Izzy's pretty much ran all the way through. And the nice thing for us is we're the one guy you haven't fought, you guys haven't fought. So we go out, go out and get a couple good wins. That puts us right back into the situation where we can be fighting Izzy again. We just got to focus on one win at a time. So you know, I know that that loss hurt him, and he was bummed out about it. Still feel like he won and all those things. But at the end of the day, man, we can't cry over spilled milk. It's time to get back to work. You know, and then with with Francis, honestly, it was just a situation that, you know, I just knew that this guy was going to be on top of whatever he was going to do. Honestly, with the, the skill set and the mind that this guy has, adversity is nothing to him. So it was just a matter of just getting him in the right position to to be successful. And credit to him, man, he he waited it out. He got the opportunity he wanted, and you know, we saw the results. The bag was not fumbled. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> did you see Aljo complaining about he thought the O'Malley fight was going to be more lucrative and it turns out it wasn't or whatever? How does it work with boxing? I mean, I don't know what you can tell us, but he obviously he fought well. Many thought he won. The bag was not fumbled. Um, but for you guys, for your team, I mean, did, did it wind up being – more lucrative in boxing than MMA or whatever. Like, what, 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 what was that? I guess like, or you know, has that been one of those things where the numbers have trickled out yet, or, or does that take longer? How, how's it even work in boxing? I, I mean, it was the most money I've ever been paid by a fighter. Um, it was, wow. it was unbelievable. You know, it was more than I expected. I wasn't expecting, you know, and obviously Francis is always taking great care of me. Um, but 
uh, it, 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 it floored me. Like when I saw my, my Wells Fargo, um, account that morning and it literally brought me to tears. That's a true story. Literally brought me to tears because he changed my life, you know, and not only in a, from a professional standpoint, but uh, a monetary standpoint, it allowed me uh, a lot of financial freedom to be able to enjoy my coaching, enjoy, um, being a, a dad and a husband. And, you know, I get to take my kids to park city this weekend, my daughter's 16th birthday, you know, helped us buy a new car. Like there's a lot of things that just with Francis moving over to boxing and then his, his, the way he takes care of his team, man, he loves every single one of us and he shows it. Um, he takes care of us and I couldn't thank him enough. So this includes Francis, the boxer outpaying Francis, the MMA fighter, and then your other guys along the way, which we're not in any way trying to disparage, obviously. We're just pointing out that this was one heck of a payment. So yet again, re-emphasizing that a bag was not fumbled because it seems like every, everyone felt uh, felt some of this, right? The, yeah, the I mean, he, you know, and, and remember, like, as his head coach, I got his, the two title fights um, with Stipe and Gone. Um, he paid me, he paid me more for the, for the Tyson Fury fight as basically his assistant behind my, uh, behind Dewey, you know, I was behind Dewey and I got paid way, well more, way more than I, than I did in the gone and, and Stipe fight. And he was, you know, he was taking care of me on that as well, percentage wise. So, wow. um, yeah, <laughs> uh, if he wants to box, man, I'm all for it <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> all day long, brother. <laughs> well, that says a lot about what they say about boxing, how it's very top heavy for the athletes. Um, and it also says something about Francis Ngannou's ger uh, generosity. I don't know that we've ever covered this publicly. And if we have, then I'll repeat it because I think it's awesome. But Francis, aside from obviously taking care of his coaches, uh, has had an impact at the gym. I mean, uh, when all that new equipment rolled through, that was his doing. Yeah, he, you know, uh, after the Stipe fight, he bought the gym – uh, entirely 24,000 square feet, you know, of, of mat space, essentially not the entire gym. We are a 24,000 square foot gym, but, um, probably eight to $10,000 or a uh, uh, square foot worth of, worth of mats. You know, he came in and brought a check to, to Ryan and said, you know, I want to, want to contribute to some improvements in the gym. And, uh, you know, he just, he's always, always had that attitude, his charity, taking care of everybody around him. You know, and I think that's something that he he loves to do. You know, and, it, and it's great because it helps all of us. And it's that rising tide raises all ships mentality. So you know, and and guys are gonna go to battle for him. Man, I don't want to sound corny, but obviously you guys know I'm in a delicate situation here with what I'm going through with my mom. But everything he told me, man, that's just so cool yeah. to hear great stories of people that have the means. They don't have to, but right. to be able to share it and change lives eric you said this guy changed your life i mean that's that's fucking phenomenal man yeah no 100 percent. and you know like even in the past like where i've i've said you know you changed my life and and he's but he's he's never really been emotional about it. he's like no you've you've changed mine too you know what i mean and you you can't really put a dollar amount on on the relationship that we all have together but you just being in this game as long as i have now just when when you have a fighter that can support you um and and you know give you money and pay you for what you know what you're worth even but just taking care of you and, and caring about the time and effort that you've put it in together and how much it helps your family and all those things man it really it really does feel good and you know all my fighters are like that but you know especially when francis is in a situation that he's in now it really you really feel it oh. eric you know that we talk about what francis did and and how it, it trickles down to to coaches and there's also a way where some of the things that he's done trickles over to some of the fighters that are still in the UFC, the way they negotiate things going forward, what's going to happen. And then what he did in PFL, right. And what he's been able to secure for his opponents that along with PFL purchasing Bellator, all that. Can you maybe talk about the landscape of MMA in 2024 and just how different that will be? I'm sure there's a lot of different puzzle pieces and, and some fighters feel like, hey, there's one less place to go now. But some of the top guys feel like, hey, we got some negotiating power. There's so many things. Can you maybe talk about that uh, that trickle effect? Yeah, I mean, I, I really think the, the jury's still out on it. But I, I think it does show that you're able to go outside of the UFC and, and still be successful. It's it's hard to it's hard to put an evaluation on something, though, when, you, when you're thinking about Francis and his star power and who and what he's capable of doing. 
Now, can like Jeremy Kennedy do that same thing? I don't know. Like there's there's guys that I just don't know if that's that's going to work out in their favor the same way it did for Francis. But it all it also I think gives guys more options, and I think more options are are important to have. You know, it's interesting to think about the availability now with sponsorships and some of the money that they can generate by, you know, going into PFL. And then, you know, Francis had some big sponsors when he fought gone that he wasn't even able to use because he was, um, you know, using crypto.com or whatever it was on our chest. He couldn't use Coinbase. And there's there's a lot of money, a lot of revenue that gets missed out on. So it's going to be interesting to see that the type of fighter um do they have a name do they have a look do they have some notoriety that they can build off their brand um and then use that sponsorship kind of avenue to make make good money doing that stuff so um it'll be interesting to see i i I was actually talking to ray today about the pfl and the bellator situation and kind of what his outlook is on that um because i have a lot of guys in both so you know just curious on how it's going to be and from what ray tells me man it's You know, it's going to be pretty cool to be able to have both working in the next two years. Bellator, I think, is kind of going to stay the same with Kogan running uh, the matchmaking and then PFL or do other things, but they'll be able to draw off of each other's rosters. I'm I'm pretty excited to see how that's going to work. You know, George brought up Sean Strickland earlier in the interview, and he is our 2023 male fighter of the year. So he's had a great year. Um, He's a guy that every time we go to the gym, he's there. There's rarely a time where we show up and he's not there. The guy puts in work. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want to ask you the question in this this manner. What happened with Drikas at the uh, event, I want to say probably pulls another gear out of this dude. But mm-hmm. I don't know that there are many gears to pull from. Like, the dude is very dedicated. Yeah. But did it motivate him more? Is it difficult as a coach to kind of level that with, hey, we also have game plans and that's something that we've been working on? What is it like to balance those things? Um, you know, I did mention that to him. Uh, I did, I did say like, Hey, you know, fighting emotional is not who we are. Um, and stylistically, I think that favors Drikas more. Uh, it opens us up more. So we need to stick with our game plan and stick with what we want to do, but don't allow your emotions to take this over. There's two sides of that coin. You know, Sean, Sean has no problem saying what he says about everybody else, you know? So People are going to probably poke and say things about him as well. I, I, I think it's a it's a tough road to toe, you know. So we can't get too emotional about those situations. You know, that they are just words. And and but at the end of the day, I, I did feel like that he was triggered and there was a few days where, you know, just kind of motivated him. Hey, he would, the motivation was there, believe me. But I wanted him to understand that we had we needed to have the right motivation. Didn't need to be this infuriated guy going in there, I'm going to kill this guy because that takes us out of our game. It takes us out of our element and what we're good at, you know? So, uh, but he's been great ever since then. And we had a good conversation about it. And I just told him I was proud of him, you know? I, I, and I don't think a lot of people really understand the, 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 the amount of people that reached out to me after he won. Um, he speaks for a demographic. He really does. And, and so many people I think have this type of upbringing where, you know, they had parents that might have been abusive or they they had they, you know, they dealt with a broken home and all these things that Sean might have dealt with. He's kind of their their, I guess, voice in a lot of ways. But what they're seeing now is somebody becoming successful and that that motivation for them is huge because they know that they can do it, too. And that's been the common denominator. A lot of times when people reach out to me, they're like, man, you know, my dad was the same way. My dad did this and this and that. And you know, seeing Sean be able to rise through all that and become a world champion motivates me to be better at this. And I told him that I was like, bro, I don't think you realize like just how much influence you have on these, on a lot of these people that might've had the same upbringing as you. So, you know, it's important to, to carry that with you and, and be the voice for these people. That's awesome. And back to Francis Ngannou for a second, Deontay Wilder, right? It's a name that has been talked about going into the PFL under mixed rules. Um, I don't know. Would you rather see him in boxing? And if that were to happen, do you think Francis has done enough where possibly if you add that to maybe Deontay's performance over the weekend, could Francis be the A side and something like that? Yeah, I do. Um, Unfortunately, I was kind of bummed to see Wilder lose, but you know, Joseph Joseph Parker is no slouch either. So, um, but it, it does take a little bit of the luster off of a Nganu Wilder fight. In my opinion, don't, don't, you know, who knows what these guys have in store, 
But, um, you know, had he won that fight, I think it definitely puts it puts us in a better situation for selling point. Right. And if it ends up being a mixed rules, are we going to fight him in MMA first, then boxing or whatever, however it's going to shake out. But after the weekend, it's like, man, I feel like Francis and Joshua is the better matchup, especially in the, in, on the boxing side of things, if that's what he ends up doing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, Francis versus anybody at this point, <laughs> I'm just sold 100%. on it. Uh, Fajeda, Bader, uh, Wild, well, yeah, maybe it goes as right. I mean, Wilder in boxing, Wilder in MMA, I mean, come on, Eric. Shoot us straight. Wilder in boxing. I'm sorry. Wilder in MMA. We're kind of wasting time. We're gonna we're gonna wax that guy, right? I mean, yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. I'd rather just. I mean, I think Francis is just gonna be more competitive in boxing, which isn't his main sport, than Wilder in MMA, which isn't his main sport. Yeah, right? do you feel the same way. And does do you think Francis kind of feels the same way? Because. I mean, one leg kick. Come on, man. Or, it's or, a wrap. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a wrap. Yeah, I, I actually really like the Fajeda fight. You know, and uh, uh, Francis and I talked about that fight as well. You know, I think he was out there for. Um, I don't know if he's out there for the finals, but when he was home, we were, we were talking about that. He's like, man, this guy's good. Like, I, I I think it'd be a really good fight. You know, and and hopefully the the PFL can build that name a little bit more uh, as as time goes on, but. For me right now, man, it's it's whatever Francis decides. I know he talked about hopefully getting back to MMA March or April, but um, you know it's already January, so we haven't had a really had had a name or heard anything. So who knows what's next? Because he isn't. I know a lot of people won't believe this, but I don't. He doesn't strike me as being money driven. You know, I really mm -hmm. feel like freedom, respect had a lot to do with, along with being compensated fairly you know you talk about missed sponsorships and stuff but can you tell can you tell what he's just more antsy for does he want to get back to wrestling and leg kicks and do the old four ounce glove thing or did boxing kind of change his appetite a little for you know like maybe more of that like what can you tell which way he's I Honestly, he's a competitor, you know, and, and I'll tell you what he wants. He wants that Tyson Fury rematch, you know, after he had a taste of that and then the competition level that, you know, many people thought that he won. Uh, I actually sat down and rewatched the fight on Sunday. It's the first time I watched it uh, since then. And, and man, like there's so many great things. I was just I was blown away. Like, I mean, obviously I was there live and watching and cornering him, but um, watching it again and then looking at like, OK, there's some areas that we can improve on and even be better at. And then there's some things that I think cardio wise that he was felt more, more comfortable as the fight went on. Um, I think it would make for a, a, a more dangerous Francis Ngannou if we were able to get that rematch. So I know that's something that he really wants. And maybe that's in the future um, because of the showing. I think that's something Tyson Fury would be interested in. I mean, now more people are going to go, okay, Francis does have a shot to win this fight it's going to bring more eyes to the situation rather than the first time around where everybody's like, Oh, this guy's going to get smoked. So, um, but while we're there, man, I mean, you know, I think, I think to be honest with you, I think that's what he wants the most. Uh, he's been back in the gym. He's been sparring. He's been kicking and doing everything else, but I definitely think the competition side of him wants that. What's that rematch. I was just thinking of something as you were talking, but Fajeda just getting his name uttered by, someone on team Nganu or Nganu himself, which in this case, you kind of quoted Nganu that, hey, this guy's a good fighter. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's not forget the opponent gets $2 million. <laughs> Anyone that's in that running has got to be a little tickled to death, right? I mean, 100%. You know, you got you got Impa calling him out now and everybody else. <laughs> that's right, they know, yeah. you know, they, they know, they know uh, what's on the other side of that uh, of that bag. You know, guys are going to be making good money if they, if they step in there and fight him. So, um, it, it is. It opens up a lot more options, that's for sure, because of the payday. This is a perfect question for you. You're a Vegas guy, all right? Born, raised, and lived there all your life. Proud Vegas fella. Saudi Arabia did come strong. Riyadh, Saudi Arabia did come strong for that event. Any other events prior to or subsequent, but it really looked like they puffed their chest out. They flew in a lot of people. They invested a lot of money. They had musical acts. They had the stage come up. I mean, it was really, really top notch. Now, me, I've only been in Vegas 15 years, goes 16, but we kind of feel like it's an adopted home now for us as well. It kind of chapped my hide, Eric, to hear that that could be the location. Uh, maybe the, I don't know if it's they're looking at themselves as a sporting capital or a combat sports capital. I'm not saying um, someone can't be a great number two. 
But did it did it blow you away like that where it could overtake beloved Las Vegas, the rich history of Las Vegas and what it's done? I mean, because Vegas boxing matches bring in the hustle, you know, the, yeah. the celebrities, the you know, it, it really can take over a town. So where do you fit on this? Uh, I, I'm with you, George. It, it blew me away. Let's, it was it was nice, and I loved every bit of it. But when you when you start to compare it to Vegas, I don't think anybody does it better than Vegas. And we, we have the infrastructure to do it. You know, we have the hotels. We have you know the the every means possible to get the people that were there to Vegas just as easy. And I I think it would be even more successful with an event like what they put on if you put that in Vegas. I think it's even more successful to be honest with you. That's not taking anything away with, with what Saudi did. I think they did a great job and they took great care of everybody there. But obviously, me being a Vegas boy, I'm partial to those those Mike Tyson, you know, and uh, yeah. the, the Lennox Lewis and and those fights that we had and, and Evander Holyfield and you know they were just amazing and the town was buzzing. Saudi Arabia doesn't really have that like feel to the town. It's not electric. The arena was. The arena was, but. You know, there's not billboards up, and and um, you know, there's not after parties, and not, you know, it's not. It would, it, just, it didn't have that same vibe and feel that it does as it would in Vegas. So, I think that they can get up there. I think they can they can do some really good things out there, and I, I envision ourselves being out there quite a bit. But nothing stacks up to Vegas. So they go to toe to toe on fight night, but fight week post fight, that's where they come up a little short against Vegas. Yeah, right? not even close. Not even close. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, tell us about the rest of the crew. I'm sure Jeremy Kennedy has a great shot of fighting for a world title. So does Manel Cop. Who yeah. else are you looking at for 2024 forecasting that they could be, you know, fighting for gold? Yeah, definitely those two uh, really jump off the page for me. And, and, you know, poor Jeremy's in a weird situation, man. He hasn't he hasn't fought since February. Um, he got a win and, and he was he was a uh, number one contender. And then Pitbull fought, you know, Sergio Pettis. He fought in Risen. He did all these things, but defend the belt in Bellator, you know. So it put put Jeremy in a peculiar situation to where now PFL being um, buying Bellator, where does that leave him? And then you got, um, you know, you got Manel, who's looked amazing. Uh, we have a tough fight against Mateus Nicolau uh, January 13th. And I think if Manel has a great showing and, and can go out and get a finish, um, it puts him right there in title contention. I, I mean, maybe one more after that. Um, and then, you know, we might be seeing him fighting for gold here in, in 2024 as well. So, you know, then you have Patchy Mix unifying the belt um, from yep. Bellator. He did an amazing job. Uh, who else? Yeah, I think Tatiana Suarez is probably a fight away from, yeah. from her fighting for a title as well within the gym. And then you got Ankalaev. Um, he's back in the room. He's fighting Johnny Walker January 13th. And, you know, another guy who's, who's very close to um to ufc gold also so the, you know the gym the gym is doing such a great job but you know what i love so much is every one of every one of our coaches is is, is successful guys had a great year the entire gym had a great year because of it and um you know it's motivating to see like you enjoy going into work and everyone's pushing each other in the right direction yeah and let's not leave out misha tate who had a great yeah. resurgence in texas i think it was austin texas that division with a man Nunez moving on. You have, you know, some contenders that Misha's kind of mixed it up with. She did take an L against Pennington, but she also beat Juliana Pena, you know, sure. a former champion, someone who's probably going to fight the winner of Buena Silva versus Pennington. And with obviously her being probably, you know, a, a, one of those that can draw and, and sell tickets, I'm sure the UFC might, you know, Maybe with one more win, she could be in the mix too. Yeah, that's a great point. And she had a great showing in her last fight. She did an awesome job. She, and, yeah, she went for it, man. You know, it, it, she looked great. So couldn't be happier for her as well. And and you're right. That puts her, you know, just from notoriety alone and, and former champion, I think that puts her right back up in those ranks again. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As always, it's a blast to talk to you. Uh, and we're so happy for your success, seeing that you uh, are now part of the Monster Energy team and, and like I say, I think you've already taken down a few Coach of the Year awards this year. So congrats on not just you, the whole team, Extreme Couture's success. I appreciate you guys, man. And all your love and support over the years, man, means the world to me. Awesome, Thank you. Man. Happy holidays, Biggie. All right. Talk to you guys.